Thanks, Jennifer. Are we going up? Yes. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg recently wrote in Wall Street Journal op-ed that the number of people connected to the internet is 2.7 billion, and it's a number that's growing um, at about 9%, which is not particularly fast. Um, we have a panel here of executives who've been directly involved in growing and speeding up that number, so let me introduce them. We have Javier Olivan, who is the VP of Growth and Analytics at Facebook. He's been there for seven years, and he's directly uh, involved in uh, efforts to expand the user base of Facebook, but he also oversees internet.org, which is the organization that Mark Zuckerberg created to go after the next billion. Jan Chipchase is the, studio, is the founder of Studio D Radio Durans, a consultancy that helps companies broaden their audiences globally. The New York Times Magazine wrote about his globetrotting work from shanty towns in Bombay and Rio to rural villages in Uganda. At the time, he was working for Nokia, helping them expand their audience globally. And the Times describes him as a human behavior researcher and a user anthropologist. Before starting his own consultancy, he was doing a similar work for Frog Design. So gentlemen, thanks for joining us. Let me ask you first to paint a picture for us of who the next billion people are. Where are they geographically? Um, urban versus rural, uh, socioeconomic status, et cetera. Uh, Jan, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. So um, for many of our clients, that would be uh, countries like Brazil, China, India, Indonesia, Russia, um, Myanmar, where we're running a project right now, and everything from lower middle class all the way down to base of the pyramid, base of the pyramid being two, three dollars a day. And, and in those geographies, can you quantify how much of that growth is one region versus another? Um, growth in what, mobile or in, connectivity? In users, users who will be connected to the internet. Um, okay, so in, in those markets, um, there are people who are formally connected to the internet through the devices that they currently have. And there's a significant growth, particularly with very low end Android smartphones mm -hmm. um, in that segment. Um, many of them are rural but rapidly urbanizing um, as well. So. I think the, the, the one interesting data point that, that we've been looking closely at is that 85% of the people that are going to be coming online, uh, they are already living in areas where there's cell coverage, um, which is an interesting data point. Like only 15% of, of the world is living in areas where there's absolutely no infrastructure. So when you think of who's going to be the next one, two, three billion people coming online, they already live in towns or in areas where there's cell phone coverage. Most of them already have cell phones indeed. They're just not using data on them. Um, okay, so, so what needs to happen to get those people connected? So I would actually argue that many of them are connected already, but not in the traditional sense of how we define connectivity. So for everyone in this audience, connectivity is that you can take out your device, whether it's a tablet, phablet, or phone, um, or your assistant takes out a device, given who's in the room, and that you can look up what you want or get information or content or whatever it is, um, personally and conveniently. But for many people who in those markets who, by the current definition, are not necessarily truly connected by that definition, um, they may have devices but can't afford, they can afford a device but can't necessarily afford the connectivity to be connected with that device. Many of them are using the device for video content and for game playing and for pretty much anything that you can do on a smartphone or feature phone that does not cost any money. Um, to use. So. Okay. Javier, you, you wear two hats at Facebook. One is growing uh, the number of people who are using Facebook globally, and you've done a pretty good, uh, you have a pretty good track record there. And the other one is internet.org. Explain how each of those is um, similar or different. Yeah, so, um, I mean, the mission of the company has always been to connect the world, make it more open and connected. And um, they're obviously related. Um, I think with Internet of the World, what we're trying to do is solve the problem of the two-thirds of the world that don't have access to Internet. That's about an affordability and awareness problem. And obviously, Facebook will benefit from the fact that there's more people online, as well as many others. And 
the one, the one elephant in the room that's there often is like, well, isn't Facebook doing this to maximize profits and, and, and yep. things like that? And if you really wanted to do that, that's not the most leveraged thing to do. You would look into raising engagement in, in the developed world where the wealthy people are, where the ad markets are developed. Um, this is something that's gonna take years and years and best case scenario, many years down the road, yeah, it might be also good for the business, but it's really not the primary driver. So, that's so what is cool. the primary driver? So it's really mission oriented, and that's how Mark always thought about the mission of the company, making the world more open and connected, by connected in, in, in richer ways than maybe just voice and SMS, but also having access to basic services that can make their life better. Social networking, search, financial services, uh, health information, those type of things. Yeah, and do you share that sort of mission that there's, we, we, there's a moral imperative to work on this and, and try to promote it? Um, on a personal level, yes. Yeah. I think as an organizational level, that's a trickier one to answer. I've seen a as lot an of- organizational, you mean for companies like Facebook or? Well, I've seen, I've seen organizations approach it as a moral imperative and that has ended up distorting um, what they've produced or what released onto the market yeah. in ways that don't necessarily make it sustainable. Explain that. Um, well, you can, if you uh, subsidize a product or service on a market, particularly for very low income consumers, mm -hmm. um, it can lead to very distorted behavioral patterns in terms of what they adopt or not adopt. I think maybe some of the things you were talking about earlier. Um. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 the one big difference of, of, you know, the product project that Facebook is doing internally versus internet.org is internet.org is built as a coalition of companies. Um, we have six founding members, and it's on a project basis. We work basically with the industry, telecoms, operators, governments, because it really takes an entire industry to solve this problem. This is not something that one company alone can build. And that's a little bit where, obviously, there's Facebook-led projects contributing to the Internet of the Org initiative, but there's many other companies contributing to it. So, for example, at the beginning of the conference, I think um, Ericsson's CEO yeah. talked about the Internet, the, the Innovation Connectivity Lab we have, where we're simulating network conditions in emerging markets so other developers in the Bali can come and see how their products perform. So there's a lot of initiatives like that, that is together with the industry, not just an internal project. Okay. Um, Jan, give us a flavor of the kind of work you do on the ground and, and how that has informed what you think these people were talking about, the, this next billion what is it they want? What is it they're going to get out of connectivity? What do they want to be connected to the global internet? Okay, so to answer that, I'll put the work that I do uh, in context. So that New York Times article that you referenced, yeah. you know, that's kind of what I was doing 10 years ago. So. Okay. So um, pretty much clients come to us and um, they're looking at the next billion, um, mm -hmm. for want of a better, uh, a better phrase, um, and they're looking to understand how they can extend their market into consumers that they haven't traditionally understood or met the needs of. And so fundamentally, we go out as a company, and as an organization, um, and we conduct research on the ground. We also do desk research. But we're known for being able to get into pretty much any context that our client needs to go in and un get meaningful data, mm -hmm. and then bring that back into the organization, and then use that to shape both the strategy and the products and services that they yeah. have. Are you at liberty to name a client and describe the work and where, what country, what? Um, we're currently act active in India, China, Brazil, um, and Myanmar, mm -hmm. and, um, but I can't name clients. And but can you describe some, the projects? Some, I can describe the projects a bit. That some of the clients or, um, were on stage being interviewed here last year. Okay, and, and the, the other part of my question was, What's you, what do you think the people who are go, are you going there and we have these companies to pitch something or are you going to ask the people what it is they want so your companies okay. uh, can provide it? So fundamentally, organizations come to us because they have a, an idea that there's a market out there for them, but they don't necessarily know how to understand what that market is and what the opportunity is. And they also, I think fundamentally, and frankly, particularly for Silicon Valley organizations, um, they don't necessarily know how to frame the engagement with those communities. Because being someone coming from a very wealthy environment and going into, for example, a slum community, 
creates an incredible power imbalance. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real art form be to being able to go into those environments, conduct the research in a meaningful and ethical manner, and then bring that value back. Um, again, based on your work, and I'm sure there's not a single answer to this, but the desire for connectivity, where does it rank? You know, people have to feed their families, they have healthcare needs, they have education needs. Where does that fit in? If they've never tasted connectivity in the way that the people in this room have, have understood it, um, it's a very obscure thing. Trying to describe the benefits of the internet to someone who's not experienced the internet is incredibly difficult, but like trying to describe time. Um, but once they've tasted inter the internet, and once they've experienced, for example, Facebook through a zero-rated plan, mm -hmm. um, and they understand the power of being able to displace their voice or their feelings or their expressions over time and space, whether it's through Facebook Messenger or text messaging or uh, a phone call or even leaving a message, that's when uh, connectivity, as, we as we're discussing it here, um, becomes something that is highly, highly desirable. And if you want an example, so um, many people look at what the kind of aspirational aspects of connectivity are and would assume that it's a device, right? It's the device that you have in your hand. It's the physical thing, and if you've got the latest model, that tells people around you um, that you can afford it and what your lifestyle aspirations are, whether you're a businessman or a social climber or whatever it is. Um, but actually, it's, if you look at behavior of consumers in those um, environments, often they have incredibly variable incomes. And when times are tough, they'll sell their device, but they'll keep the SIM and until they can get enough work to be able to re-afford re a device. But they're still connected, and that phone number, the person who's in another town doesn't necessarily know that you don't actually have a phone. All they know is that you have a phone number, but you're not connected. So your SIM is your identity? The phone number or Facebook identity, these persistent identities that exist, um, yes, can be these identities. I'll give you a simple example. So we did a study in Lagos recently, and on the streets of Lagos, I don't know how many people have been there, but it's an incredibly entrepreneurial society, and people love coming up to you and saying, hey, how are you doing? What's your phone number? But instead of saying, what's your phone number, they actually say, what's your Facebook as a thing? And, but if you actually probe them on whether they've used Facebook, many of the people who would say that wouldn't have necessarily used it, but they understand that Facebook as an ideal, everything that's wrapped up in Facebook as a connectivity and what you can do with it is something that is desirable. So th th that brings me to, you know, it's a, a great jumping off point, but w when you are trying to expand Facebook's audience, how do you go, I mean, is Facebook relevant to, you're going after people who are very different from the people who are your core constituency today. Is Facebook relevant to them? How do you make it relevant? You know, how does that fit in? So, you know, I'll, the research with is actually very consistent with some of the things that you were saying of people having this aspiration to be connected. And, and indeed, we've done research where we ask, hey, do you know what internet is? Some people say, no, do you want internet? I don't know what it is. Do you, do you know what Facebook is? Do you want Facebook? And they would say yes. And that is where I think we have a big responsibility to, to try to, to, to solve uh, as you know, the, the, the killer app that they want to use first. Create this set of free basic services, basically, which solve the affordability problem and get them to be aware of what are all the capabilities you get when you're connected. And you know, free basic services should be services that don't consume much data because if they're going to be free, obviously, we still need to make it profitable. And, and these are services you're, that, that, that internet.org is developing. So we're creating the framework so that together with operators and maybe the local government, the local entrepreneurs in a country, we can create a custom tailored offer for that country mm -hmm. where uh, there will be a set of, you know, maybe it's Facebook and some health service relevant to this country. Some, so that's the piece where we will work together with entrepreneurs, governments, telecoms to decide what's the right mix for the country. And those should be offered as, as a free service that you can use, but that leads to potentially premium content and therefore people at the end of the day paying for premium content, which makes them the, system, the service and the model sustainable for operators though. Okay, I'm gonna to go to audience questions in a second, so start, start prepping. Um, 
One of the, when you think about the economics, a lot of these people are not, um, they're on very uh, modest incomes. In the developing world, if you think about the cost of a smartphone over two years being about $2,000, it's three quarters your service plan, one quarter the device. In the developing world, it, I understand it's 90-10. It's 90% 90, 90 connectivity. We're all focused on cheaper devices for the developing world. In fact, devices are actually quite cheap. Um, wh why this difference and what can, you know, I, I presume internet.org is trying to address some of that. Um, why is it so different over there? Um, so the, the, the one thing that we're definitely trying to do is optimize for those type of devices so that the services don't consume as much data. And one of the things we see is, you know, if you live in the Silicon Valley, you're running around with an iPhone, LTE network, everything is fast and amazing. But the services you develop, you just go to these markets and they just don't work, like because of the network status and the lower capabilities of the phone. So one key thing we're doing is developing so things work and minimize data over the wire so that... And that would address the cost issue? That helps solving part of the cost issue. Um, and then the other thing is how can we offer some basic services free that still lead to premium services, but people still then can decide how much they want to consume. Um, you have had some success in the Philippines. Talk about it. How, uh, you know, what did you do and how many people were added to the global network, so to speak. Yes, yeah, so we've been running multiple tests, uh, one of the most successful ones with Globe in the Philippines, where we basically tested to offer Facebook for free for a period of time. And within months, we saw basically we could double the number of people using data in the Globe network, which led to basically 3 million new people connected to the internet over a matter of months, which shows if we can deploy this at scale, this will meaningfully change the trajectory of adoption of the internet. And the model was very successful for Globe Telecom. They could, after they turned the, the, the test off, they would still retain the majority of the users that started using it for free, but then saw the value to your point and then realized, hey, there's like real value in doing this. I'm willing to put a little bit of my disposable income to, to data. Um, now the, what we're trying to ultimately achieve is a model where operators don't think it as a marketing campaign that you put turn it on and off, but rather something you leave it on because it just accelerates the pace at, you, at which you get more people connected and over time also more revenues. And can you take that now to new geographies? Yeah, we're actually managing? testing as we speak with Tigo in, in Paraguay, Tanzania, and uh, we're just about to start a test with Excel in Indonesia. So we're like testing different geographies uh, with different partners with the goal of deploying a global pro program once we have something working. And in the work you do and that internet.org does, how much do you have boots on the ground trying to understand those cultures, the, the needs of the people there, you know, the kind of work Jan does or has done, um, you know, how much does Facebook do that? A lot. It's absolutely essential. I mean, you just cannot do it out of the Silicon Valley. You need to be in the ground. And I mean, Jan Camfrolli speaks for hours about why it's so critical to be there, understanding, observing the audience you're trying to address. Because there's so many issues that you cannot even imagine they exist, from basic things like people don't know what a username password is, which you would assume that's normal. But it's not normal if that's the first time you ever get connected. So there's that, that's a simple one, but then let alone la different language scripts, input entry methods. There's a set of challenges that is inimaginable from the valley, and you need yeah. to be there. Yeah, and can you think of uh, something we in our world might not think of that you've encountered in, say, Myanmar? Or... Yeah, I mean, uh, you see these wonderful, quirky examples. Mm -hmm. um, but so, for example, um, uh, outside Ibadan, which is the second city in uh, Nigeria, um, stopping off at a roadside. Um, kiosk, and there's a little pharmacy, and amongst all the medicines, so all in white boxes, and probably about 75% of the medicines are fake by um, <laughs> most metrics, there's a bottle of extra virgin olive oil. And sometimes you look at it and it just doesn't quite register. Why is there extra? Why do you think there's extra virgin olive oil? Ah, uh, you tell me. Well, it's, you know, I, I, um, we, so when we run this research, we always hire a local crew. We're only as smart as our local crew. 
and it's because of these kind of contextual nuances. Yeah. People have extra virgin olive oil, obviously, to be able to anoint themselves, because mm -hmm. what else would you use? Duh. Yeah. <laughs> and what does that have to do with global connectivity? It's that, just, that probably it's has just an illustration of, of uh, you, are, you asked for an example, yeah. an, an illustration of uh, something taken out of context yeah. with a totally different meaning. Got it. So. Excellent. Uh, questions? Anybody out there? All right, let me ask. Um, let, let me keep going. Um, is there a downside to connecting all these people? Or from pushing technology on them without thinking about the consequences? Would you like to go first? I mean, there's certainly there's an upside based on like all the studies that people have been doing. I mean, Deloitte just recently published a study where they, they basically measure that if, if we brought connectivity to the developing world, it could create 140 million new jobs, lift 160 million people out of poverty, give access to education materials to 600 million uh, kids. So there sure would be some downsides too, like maybe connectivity amplifies the good and the bad of the world, but I think on the net, I think, I believe it's a positive. So whatever downside there might be is, is outweighed by, by the positive. That's my personal belief. Broadly speaking, yes. So technology amplifies behavior, and having a dev mobile device allows people to conduct business further, faster, um, connect with loved ones, and so on. It allows them to set off IEDs in places like Afghanistan, where we run projects. Um, uh, I'm sorry, to? Set off I, uh, roadside bombs. Right. You know, one example. So that, that would be the downside example. Yeah. Um, That's an extreme downside. Yeah. I think um, surveillance um, and who is in ultimately in control of the network and sees what's going through the network and how mm -hmm. that's used. You mm -hmm. could argue that that is a significant downside. Some people have been, some people would argue that's a positive, but. You've tackled the, the question of whether um, connectivity is a human right. W w what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I, so I wrote a piece for CNN um, um, a couple of years ago, and it was around the time of the Egyptian revolution, and I was lucky enough to be working there around that time, and so there were still um, demonstrations in Tahir Square, and there was a lot of energy around the Facebook revolution, and um, a lot of energy around particularly on the West Coast US, around social media's role in, in that activity. And I'm not saying that it didn't have a role. I just felt that um, the people who were making that case weren't necessarily looking in the backyard and looking at what's happening, for example, in the US, and the people in the US who are not connected, um, and giving it the same level of energy. So it's kind of, it pisses me off a bit when People see it because it's a kind of sexy topic to talk about mm -hmm. and because it's somewhere else, but they don't necessarily have the, give the same level of seriousness to their own backyard. Okay. Do we have questions from the audience? S still nothing. Okay. It's, it's early. Just one over there. Oh, we got a question over here. For example, the Philippines, how many um, subscribers do they have? You said they added three million. What was their base? Huh. I don't know the exact number, but, uh, well, it doubled their number, so it must have been in the three and then went up to six. But I would, I would have to confirm the exact number that, that is. Can, can you speak up? Uh, well, it wasn't on. The question is the, the, the cost. So why not do that, right? Incrementally, it's all new subscribers and whole value. So I guess the reason they wouldn't do it would be the extra infrastructure costs, Ericsson, all these different complications, because there's a no-brainer why it works for everyone eventually, but what's going to be the inhibitor to get there? No, there, there, there's a reason which is um, their most popular data plan was a Facebook-only data plan. So they had a lot of subscribers already paying for Facebook. So when you all of a sudden offer it for free, those people that were paying for Facebook stop paying for Facebook. So that is the downside that you have in terms of economical cost. So what we're like now looking is how can we make it so that the basic, the set of free basic services is more targeted to the people that cannot, can truly not afford it versus, you know, those that really can. So that, that's kind of the, the downside. Anyone else? 
Um, Jan, you, you sometimes talk about when multinationals look at these markets, they approach them with a certain naivete. W what is that naivete about, and how, how, what's your advice to any company here that wants to, to understand and learn and go after those markets? Okay, so first of all, let's recognize that those markets are incredibly diverse. Yes. India has a larger middle class in the whole of Europe, X, Y, Z, right? Yep. So, but let's say you're talking about the last 10, 15% or the last 30% who are not connected. Mm -hmm. So generally people who are a little bit poorer. So yeah, I think um, especially in uh, Silicon Valley, there's um, a naivety around the questions that are being asked. And naivety can be a very positive thing. It allows you to mm -hmm. um, disregard all the kind of ingrained in, uh, assumptions about how things should be done. What's, but, what's an example of a naive question that a, a company may ask? They're very, they tend to be very precise yeah. based on exactly what they're trying to do in the market. I can't answer that without okay. giving away the client. Darn. Um, but trust me, they're okay. very naive. So. But the, the um, advice would be um, to understand who on the ground can give you uh, uh, the inside edge on what's actually happening on the ground and mm -hmm. as rapidly as possible get people within your organization that are going to be making decisions about what's happening on the ground, on the ground, in a meaningful way. So. It sounds like it's a fairly costly and potentially costly and, and not hugely scalable. You got to go country by country. Well, you can generalize on countries and mm -hmm. most clients that ask us to do work, they ask us to look at three key markets and not 15 of their markets. Mm -hmm. um, but I'd argue that the cost of not doing that is far greater because you're investing in things that have a significantly higher level of uh, chance of failure or being wholly inappropriate. And you're wasting a lot of your organization's resources of chasing something that is wholly unrealistic. Okay. Um, any other questions here? Uh, good morning, David Kenney. My question is how prepared are governments in these nations for connectivity and how are you helping them? A couple of examples in our, in our world, um, we have models to predict storms, but yet it's never a good idea for the media to be warning people that should be a government function, but the government isn't ready. They, uh, we have an issue in America around the NSA. It could be far worse in many of these nations. So nations have a much bigger responsibility to govern when you've connected their people. How are you helping them get ready? So, we have a policy team that is working every day with governments all over the world, and um, we're partnering with them as part of the Internet of the Initiative um, in a way to figure out what are the right basic services that we should be offering to the population. Um, but that is a really you know, fundamental question, how to like, train governments in how to manage a hyper-connected nation. I mean, at least economics, and the studies done seem to show that connectivity helps with GDP and all the good things. Um, so from an economic perspective, it seems to be a good thing. Now, how to deal with a population that has access to all information in real time if you were coming from a point where it wasn't the case, that's obviously a challenge that, that they have to figure out. Uh, let me ask the last question. Um, Javier, with the work you guys are doing, do you think this 9% that Mark was talking about can be accelerated? I really believe if we can deploy this at scale, and, and we believe we're in a really good path, it will for sure fundamentally change the trajectory at which internet is being adopted right now. By Based how on much? The test, can you quantify it? Or? So what we've seen in the test right now is that the adoption rate can as much as double. Uh, now, I don't know how it behave when you run it at scale versus on a test control mm -hmm. environment. Um, but it certainly, there's a big layer of people, the next billion, the next two billion, where solving the awareness and the affordability issues for sure will accelerate the pace dramatically. And Jan, what's your prediction of where, how this is going to evolve? Connectivity? Yeah. Um, well, right now, we're, for example, right, running a project in Myanmar. It's currently 15% penetration. The estimate is by the end of next year, it'll be 50% penetration. So wow. that's uh, hugely that's... steep um, learning curve. And many of the people who are buying their first mobile device, they're buying a smartphone, right? 
Um, and that's the kind of baseline. So when they look at the dialing feature on the phone, they're kind of ignoring that and going straight to the um, Viper, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the local uh, yeah. uh, app that is used for dialing and so on. Okay, thank you very much. We're out of time. Thank you. Please thank our panelists. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.